Hey fellow explorers, we all have those travel moments that maybe we'd rather forget, and in this video, I'm gonna be spilling the beans on some of my most epic travel fails, epic blunders, and in this video, we're gonna learn from some of my mistakes or just maybe ways that I've recovered from things that nature did to me or us, and uh, hopefully you can get a good laugh along the way about the situation or the resolutions. And uh, as we go along, I'd love to hear about some of your most epic travel fails too, so we can have a good laugh all together here. Okay, uh, so the first epic travel fail that I wanna share with you out of 19 that I've got for you today is when I had some lost luggage on the way to Marseille. So the <clears throat> way this story goes, this was, boy, maybe 15 years ago, I would say. And I was flying from San Diego on United Airlines to Washington Dulles, Washington Dulles on United Airlines to Brussels, Brussels Airlines from Brussels Airport to Marseille, which is where I took this little puddle jumper plane. And then when I arrived in the south of France in Marseille and went to claim my luggage, guess where it was? Not there. When I went to the lost luggage desk, guess where they said my luggage was? <laughs> they had no idea. Hooray. And I was there for a business trip. I had to meet with people in like <clears throat> nice clothes and dress shirts and ties and I didn't have any, they were all gone, including my size 14 shoes. And boy, arriving into France on a Sunday, not a great day if your luggage gets lost because everything is closed in France on Sundays. And so the only place I could find that was open was a car four. It's basically like the French version of Walmart and I bought a whole wardrobe from the French Walmart I still have some of those things today, shorts and pants and this and that. I was there for a week, and you know when my luggage showed up? Never. Uh, the Brussels Airlines travel desk uh, was open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day for four hours. I could call them and be like, hey, has my luggage arrived? And they'd be like, no. And eventually they were like, well, you know what? We're actually not really sure. We have so many bags here in the airport in Marseille. Um, you can just come and maybe rummage through them and see if your luggage is here, which it never arrived. After a week, I flew on my way back home to the USA, and about three weeks after I got home in the USA, I got a phone call from US Airways from the San Diego airport. Uh, their lost luggage service. They said they have just received a suitcase that came in from Phoenix and it's got my name on it. <laughs> and they're like, we would like to deliver it to you. I'm like, you have, you have what? You have my, you have a suit, where did it come from? Well, it's got a lot of different locations on it, but yeah, we got it here. And I'm all right, so sure enough, they drove it to my house and my suitcase was soaking wet when I went to open it, like soaking wet. And it must've got soaking wet probably on the journey there, or I don't know, landed in a puddle or a lake someplace later. My clothes were great white shirts that were no longer white. They were green and blue and all sorts of colors. And so then I had the wonderful uh, fortune of dealing with Brussels Airlines for my lost luggage. Chris, you said you start on United. Why didn't you deal with United for your lost luggage? Because the airline you deal with, if your luggage is lost on a journey, is the final leg of your journey, which meant I got to deal with Brussels Airlines. And eventually uh, we got to the claim where they're like, fine, we'll refund you for the cost of those things. Although they did say, well, Chris, maybe you can clean it. You can send the suitcase out to be cleaned or the shirts out to be cleaned. And I was like, this stuff can't be clean. This is ridiculous. It looks like it's been in the bottom of a porta potty or something. Uh, and they're like, okay, well, we'll replace your stuff. But you need to give us the receipts of the things you had in there say what the receipts of the thing who keeps the receipts of everything that was in their suitcase um needs to say i submitted receipts for things that likely could have been in that suitcase i did not have a stradivarius violin receipt to send to them but i think all in told i didn't ask for more than what was destroyed but ever since then i have only been checking in hard side suitcases to avoid any sorts of 
water issues. <laughs> and I see in the chat, Codge Full of Love said they had to fish it out of the lake. I think they did. Uh, and Brandon says, I'm glad I haven't had that situation yet. I am glad you haven't had that situation yet either. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so next up, we've got number two, which is on a trip to Naples, Italy. I did not realize that there was a trash strike when I was going to Naples, Italy. And this led to one of my uh, videos that's been loved and also hated at the same time because I made a video titled Naples, the city of trash. Because when we were there, there was so much trash all over the street and it was so immensely gross. Uh, and I just... It isn't a thing. It isn't a thing to think about, right? To be like Naples has all of these different trash strikes, and you know, I was like, well, um, I guess, I like, I, I guess I still have to tourist around the city. I just became like the locals when they would go around a corner and they would put their fingers on their nose and go like this. I'm like, okay, I guess that's where the trash is. If you've not seen my video titled Naples, Italy, the city of trash. When I say, like, there was so much trash around the city, it is like they hadn't picked up trash in the city for months. Imagine what a city turns into when trash hasn't been picked up for months. Uh, people have to throw their trash away, so they find the little trash can that might have been on a street corner and now pile it up with trash 20 feet in every which direction. Not something that I really want to relive. Uh, all right. The third biggest travel fail and mistake was on a trip we took to Lisbon. This is another one in the way back machine. How young does Chris look right there? Probably Chris from about 10 years ago. That's the OG Topher. And uh, I, we, did not realize there was going to be not a trash strike when we went to Lisbon, but a transit strike when we went to Lisbon. Should look up transit strikes when you go to Europe. They strike a lot, it turns out, in public transportation. We were staying in this hotel, not in the city center, but just like two stops on the subway from the city center. Except it wasn't running. <laughs> that makes it a lot harder to get into the city center. And then when there's a transit strike, guess what? It is much harder to actually get a, uh, a rental car. Not a rental car. It's a lot harder to get a taxi, believe it or not. I have things about rental cars in just a minute too, but we are not there yet. Uh, in the chat, I see uh, the narrow road says the airline. So I, I asked about your experiences with lost luggage and uh, narrow road says the airline lost my luggage on the trip I took to propose to my wife. Fortunately, I had the ring with me. Oh my gosh, Nero, that is so awful. That's awful. And I don't mean to laugh at your misfortune, but when I think about these things that I'm sharing today, I think either laugh or cry. Lucky you had the ring with you. Uh, Nero, did it, did it go? Did it go all right? Even though you didn't have your luggage? Uh, hopefully it did. Josephus says that Lisbon also copied the cable cars from San Francisco. I love the Lisbon cable cars. They're pretty cool. Although they have just a little bit of graffiti on them. Okay, the fourth uh, epic travel fail that I had. This is my lost in translation travel fail. Uh, so this is, I, you know, I say this because I, I should know better than this. I went to Taipei, Taiwan, uh, OC Girl and the Curious Princess. They were already there and they'd been there for a few weeks. And when I got there, we were going to meet at my favorite pot sticker restaurant in Taipei. And this place... All they sell is pot stickers, and they recently switched from a, just like ordering uh, in person to using a computer screen to order. So this is the first time I'd use the computer screen to order, and the computer screen doesn't have any pictures or anything to look at, just Chinese characters, which I can speak a little bit of Mandarin Chinese, but my character comprehension, my reading, and my writing, not so great. And so as I'm at this kiosk, deciding what to order. And by the way, they only have one thing, pot stickers, and one price for something. And then the question is just, how many do you want? Um, and so one order of pot stickers at this pot sticker restaurant that I really like in Taipei is 80 Taiwan dollars, which translates to about 
$2.50. And so I figure with a price that low, I would need at least two orders of pot stickers. I mean, how many pot stickers can you get for $2.50? So I ordered two orders of pot stickers, and it turns out that this plate that you see in front of me right here uh, is 40 pot stickers, which is what I ordered because each order of pot stickers was 20 pot stickers. And now I understand when I was ordering this, the whole restaurant staff had this whole chatter about like this, that, and another, and 40 for that guy. And I, you know what? The American, he must be hungry. I, I probably got through a good 25 of them, but I could not make my way through 40 pot stickers. Paintkiller93 says, I want to try those pot stickers. They're really good. Uh, they're in my Taipei vlog. Um, so you can check those out if you are going to Taipei. They're in the Yonghe neighborhood, right across the street from the main entrance of the Lehua Night Market. That's where you'll find that place. All right, epic travel fail number five. Uh, this is another fairly recent one. This brings us back to October of 2022 uh, to this place right here. Where is this a picture of? That's not the contest for winning a shirt. But if we look at this picture, this picture is when we went to Whistler. Whistler in Canada. And we're not big like ski or snowboard junkies. And so we decided to go to Whistler in shoulder season. We went to Whistler in October. But one of the things that we really wanted to do was we wanted to ride this gondola. This is the peak to peak gondola in Whistler. If you're not familiar with Whistler, Whistler is North America's largest ski resort. So it's in Canada, but it's bigger than any ski resort in the USA. And uh, there are two main mountains in Whistler that have lifts that go up to them. And they built this um, gondola that connects the two. It's a really awesome ride. And we specifically wanted to like go do that to, to ride it and then do the hikes on the top of the mountains. And when we were planning our itinerary, you know, I looked to see when these gondolas close for the summer before winter. And when we looked online, booking six months out, uh, the Whistler website said these go until the end of October. That's how long the peak to peak tram runs. And so then you know, we plan out our itinerary and about a week out, we're looking on the Whistler website for things like, okay, like where exactly do we go to buy the tickets? And only to realize that now they have significantly shortened the schedule. <laughs> the gondolas no longer go until October 30th. They now end much, much earlier in October, meaning that we couldn't ride it when we had planned to ride it. We'd have to ride it on our second day when we get there. We're originally gonna spend some time in Vancouver and then go to Whistler. Instead, like three days before our trip, we had to cancel all of our hotels and rebook all of our hotels and move our itinerary all around, which we are definitely travel planners and like things well ahead of time, uh, but that was the only way to work it out. Um, but it was, epic re-replanning, and so in that case, you just hope to get what you uh, what you get. My uh, lesson learned here, going to any kind of like ski or snow destination, particularly ones that are seasonal, hmm, you might not wanna go right at the edge of the season when it closes, because a lot of these places tend to close a little bit earlier, open a little bit later, so if you actually wanna do kind of the summery things, go in peak summer, or if you wanna go in winter, go in peak winter. If you're going in the shoulder season, then you're sort of rolling the dice and you need to be really flexible when things like this change. Um, all right. The sixth uh, travel fail, and I'm not gonna touch on this one for a long time because it still makes me sad to this day, but when we were in London a few years back, if you've been following this channel for a long time, you'll know that's when uh, the OG Topher was stolen from us. Uh, I had my travel bag uh, with my camera in it, Topher was in it. I put it right next to my leg at a restaurant in London. We were seated on the street, but right next to the building. So my bag was like right next to my leg, right between my leg and the building of this restaurant uh, called Mother Mash in downtown London. And when the waitress came to take my order is when I think somebody came to take my bag that was down by my legs. Uh, had my camera in it, had my panda in it. Um, luckily it did not have my wallet or my passports or any of those sorts of things. We called the police, the restaurant staff called the police, the police didn't come and they're like, 
what are we gonna do? Your stuff's gone. We went to, they're like, you can come to the police station to file a report. We filed a police report. Nothing happens. They never called us. I'm sure this is a big city thing where they're like, what am I gonna do? Your bag's probably already gone. Um, but it just really reminded me as a traveler, how much of a target we can be. And I made a video about this experience one, this video where I was robbed. Two, that I made a video about scams in London where I talk about all these scams that affect tourists. And then, you know, British people watch that and go like, these things are all crock. I've lived in London for 55 years and none of these things have ever happened to me. And you know why? Because the scammers target tourists because they know that tourists let their guard down and they're easy tar targets. It's the same thing for me in California. A lot of people come to California and have Things like this happen to them, sadly. Um, never happened to me, why? Because I live here and the people who are these lousy scum of the earth, they don't pick and prey on the people from the place because they know you're street smart when you're at home, but you're not when you're away. Um, but if, you, uh, if you've been following this, you know that uh, that's when all of y'all responded and all of these pandas began to arrive and that's the beginning of the Yellow Productions crew. So that's why there's all these pandas in the background because all of them were sent by many of you that are watching this live stream today. Um, and uh, Karen said, Karen says, like the smash and grabs in San Francisco, we were a victim of that last May at the Japanese garden. So sad to hear that Karen. Um, one of the videos that I actually just started writing today is how to avoid uh, getting your car broken into because that's something that I hear more and more that like ruins people's vacations and you can never make your car theft proof but there's certainly things you can do to help be less um, less of a target and so that's what I intend to talk about in that video. Uh, Remy wants to share one of his experiences. Mine was during a ski trip to Canada on the day we were going home. It snowed so bad that our 12 passenger van could not get up past a steep hotel driveway. Waited eight hours for a tow truck. Oh my gosh, Remy. That's, uh, that's awful. That's a really long time. Um, we will talk about driving in the snow because I've had one of those experiences too. Okay. Tip number seven. Uh, this also happened on our recent Asia trip, and this was, mm, we went to Taipei, and then we went to Japan, and we had booked tickets. I guess I should say I, because in this case, this is my epic travel mistake. I had booked us tickets on China Airlines onward from Taipei to Haneda, Tokyo. And what I didn't realize until the day before was that I typoed our daughter's name. One letter of difference in her middle name. One letter of difference, I noticed. And so I called up China Airlines and said, hey, I made this typo, is this a big deal? And they're like, yeah, well, if it doesn't match your passport, it's a big deal, uh, so we need to fix it. I'm like, okay, let's fix it. They're like, cool, that'll uh, be $50 for a reticketing fee. You gotta talk to the ticketing department. Uh, there's only one person working today. You'll be on hold for a little while. All said and done, I spent two hours on hold with China Airlines from my hotel in Taipei. Uh, and had to pay a $50 reticketing fee. So just a tip, if you book your, when you book your airline tickets, check and double check to make sure the names are correct and the dates are correct. Most airlines will give you like a 24 hour, like, oh, so sorry, you can fix anything within the first 24 hours. And so that's when you wanna do it, not the day of. Uh, and you know, we typically do this on dates where like after I book flights, I'll forward them to OC girl, my wife and say, Hey, can you just, can you give me a second set of eyes to look at that and make sure I did that all correctly? The typo in the name was something so insignificant that I just didn't notice it until the day before when we went to do the online check-in. Uh, Adriana says, I love this. This tells me that there is not a perfect itinerary. Anything can change. Clearly the Whistler experience made everything change and for sure. Uh, Painkiller, oh, this is an awful one. Says, uh, my worst travel mistake was booking the Eurostar from London to Paris when I was actually in Paris headed to London. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, Painkiller, were you able to get your money back on that ticket or did you just 
Did you just have to buy a second ticket? What did you have to do? Uh, Paint Killer um, says one about his parents, that his parents were robbed in Barcelona. Within minutes of arrival, they were scheduled to go on a cruise. It didn't happen in the airport, Paint Killer. Where, ouch, that's, that's awful. I am sorry to hear that too. Uh, and uh, Kathy says, I booked uh, you er in Taipei and I went to the, a tour. maybe that's a tour. Yeah, I booked a tour in Taipei and went to the wrong place. That's another bummer too because I'm sure the tour went on even though you weren't there. A lot of folks relating to my stolen story. BTVS said I had my bag with my laptop stolen. I put it down my feet in Barcelona. Uh, Learn to never sit a bag at my feet without putting a leg through a strap. That is a good tip that you learn. Uh, and so hopefully we can learn these mistakes from each other without having to uh, make them ourselves. Okay, let's go on to number eight. Number eight. The eighth mistake, you know, um, Vancouver has has not been great to us. We love Vancouver, but we've had some, some of these epic travel fails happen to us in Canada on both of our trips to Canada. The one we talked about from Whistler, we had to move everything around. This one was one we went to Vancouver and we stayed at the Fairmont Vancouver downtown hotel that has this really small parking garage. And this was the minivan that I rented for five of us that were traveling. Myself, OC Girl, the princess, OC Girl's mom and OC Girl's brother. So we needed a big car. And, you know, I was driving through the parking garage and one of the pillars just jumped out and scratched the side of my minivan. That's the story I told the rental car company. I don't think they believed me at all. Uh, actually, it was um, when we were uh, the gate, the parking gate, not the gate itself, but like the ticket machine or whatever as we went out. This super narrow exit and I scraped the side of the minivan. How much did this repair cost? $2,000, $2,000 US dollars to fix these scrapes on the side of the minivan. Luckily, I had booked the rental car reservation with the Chase Sapphire Reserve credit card, which provides um, primary rental car collision damage insurance. And so luckily I was able to take that $2,000 bill from Hertz in Canada and send it to Chase and Chase paid the whole thing off. Not without 10 hours of my time going back and forth between all the paperwork I had to file with Chase and all of the stuff I had to send back to Hertz. Um, but it was uh, absolutely a godsend to not have to pay the $2,000 for scraping the side of that car. Uh, and Karen absolutely hates it when things leap in front of her car. I hate it too. I hate it too. That's it. Okay. Um... The ninth travel fail that we've had, uh, and this wasn't one that was a mistake of ours. This is one that the world did something to us, or in this case, Southwest Airlines did something to us, or Southwest IT did something to them. This was, uh, we were caught up in the great Southwest Airlines meltdown of 2022. If you didn't hear about that, or you don't know what that was, uh, that was basically around Christmas time in 2022. Southwest's computer system just like melted down and they could not fly for weeks. I kid you not. And we were planning to go in 2022 to Sedona, Arizona, which if you follow the channel here, you'll know we actually finally went like two weeks ago. Um, but we didn't get to go to Sedona. We were going to fly from Orange County to Phoenix. Didn't get to go to Phoenix because Southwest canceled everyone's flights. Except they didn't bother to tell anyone either. Like, we never got the cancellation message. Uh, I had to go look at the Southwest Airlines website where it said canceled, but there was no email. I could even still check in for the flight. Um, luckily, we didn't end up at the airport, but then our flights couldn't go, so we had to cancel all of our hotels. Luckily, because there were clearly so many people stuck everywhere, when we called the hotels in Phoenix and Sedona, they're like, you know, I got a line of people that would love this room. And so it's one of the few times I've had hotels like not enforce the three day like cancellation penalties. And then Southwest did ultimately give credits to people some months later about any expenses that you had and gave people $25,000 rapid rewards points travel vouchers that were worth $250 that we used to book our recent flights to Sedona. Um, 
but uh, we we um, in this meltdown we were like, should we go? Should we fly someplace else? And then we were like, the world, no, because with all the Southwest planes out of commission, every other flight is going to be topsy turvy. And so then we were just like, all right. Where's some place we can drive? And that's why we ended up in Palm Springs. So the Palm Springs travel guide, if you enjoyed that one from 2022, you can thank Southwest Airlines for sending us to Palm Springs instead of Sedona, Arizona. Uh, Art says, have you ever got on the wrong plane? Wrong train? Yes, wrong plane, no. Maybe I've tried to board the wrong plane, uh, but I've never got on the wrong plane. Have you, how do you get on, like, how do you get all the way to get on the wrong plane? I don't know, does it, has anybody here ever been like on the wrong plane? All right, before we go on to 10, I'm thirsty. What's Chris drinking today? Chris today is drinking an iced matcha latte from Starbucks, which actually they do a, a relatively pleasant matcha latte. What I love about Starbucks is you can order it online and it's just waiting for you when you get there. All right. Uh, Kat says Marriott has two-day cancellation. Depends on the Marriott. Depends on the hotel. Like if you're staying at the Marriott in Vail, Colorado, they have a 45-day cancellation window. Really? <laughs> really? Um, so, yes, it does indeed depend. Okay. This is a fun story. So, speaking of Sedona... When we were in Sedona uh, recently, we sort of planned it as a relatively last minute kind of thing. Maybe like three weeks before we were going to go. We're like, hey, what are we doing over the holiday weekend in February? Nothing. Why don't we go to Sedona? We've got these Southwest travel vouchers. Let's go check that out. So we booked it about three weeks beforehand um, and uh, found it um, challenging uh, to make dinner reservations because Sedona is a really popular place. OC Girl did make a really great dinner reservation for our second night, but not for our first night. And so our first night in Sedona, we like at 6 p.m. go to this one restaurant, line out the door, go to this other restaurant, so busy we can't even park in the parking lot uh, that then we, where do we end up for our dinner in Sedona? As foodies, people who like food, where did we end up? Right here. The McDonald's with the blue arches, that's right. Although people tell me they're actually called teal. The color is teal that they use of those arches in McDonald's. And what, a, what, am, what am I eating? I am eating the adult Happy Meal. If you haven't been to McDonald's in a long time, they actually have adult Happy Meals that have adult toys. Um, the food tastes the same. It doesn't, doesn't taste any better. So uh, the moral of this story is make your dinner reservations. You can always cancel them if you don't want to go, but if you have them and you have them locked in, uh, then you at least have an option, which in the case of us in Sedona, we had no options because we had no reservations. Adriana says unplanned vacations are awesome. It was a great trip, actually. Um, but I, we are, as much as I might say we're reservation people and we're foodie people, we also tend to be like fast foodie people. Like we like fast casual places, but it turns out Sedona is very like sit down table service kind of place and very few uh, actual fast options. The funny thing about this, when we were we were at McDonald's, uh, like so many people were in there too, there was even a bride and a groom, like uh, whether they were taking pictures that day or taking engagement pictures, I don't know, but a wedding dress and a suit uh, eating at the table next to us in McDonald's. Probably same experience. They couldn't find any place else to eat. So where are they eating on their wedding night? Mickey D's. Dinner of Champions. Uh, okay. Before I go on to number 11, Narrow Road has a Southwest experience. Says, Southwest canceled my flight to Orlando at 2 a.m. Glad I forgot to turn my phone off, vibrate. I acted quickly when I got the text and got on another flight. Others did make it. Wow. Uh, so uh, it's good. It's good that you noticed and you, you seized the day. Uh, okay. Um... Da, 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 da. So, number 11 right here is when we stayed in Osaka, Japan, at the Hotel Monterey, Osaka. And I picked this picture because this is a picture of me looking out the hotel's window. And you can watch this hotel review. It's still up on the channel. What we 
What we liked about this hotel, what we like a lot about a lot of hotels in Japan, we like when they're near the train station because it's really convenient to walk to the train station. And most hotels in Japan that are near the train station have very soundproof windows, so you don't actually hear the trains. But in the case of this hotel, I think their walls must have been made of paper. And so the view outside of the window, which is this, this was the view outside of our window. You can see the like, like eight train lines down there, including the bullet train. It was so noisy. I felt like the trains were running through our hotel room. I, uh, I would, I would say I'm a fairly light sleeper. Um, so I had a hard time going to sleep. And the good news is the trains do stop running at like midnight and don't start up again until like 5, 5.30, something like that. So I got a cool, I got a cool five hours of sleep every night in that hotel room. Something really to be mindful of if you're staying near a, um, near a train station is to absolutely uh, like read the reviews on TripAdvisor or on Planning.com, which you've heard me talk about. Listen to creator reviews about like, was that actually a good hotel? There was another hotel that we stayed in, had the similar issue in Modesto, California. It's like a, like a double tree in Modesto. And I was uh, traveling there uh, <laughs> with someone else. He picked this hotel and then he's like, oh, I just, I should warn you about the train. I'm like, what, what about the train? He's like, well, it comes by every night. Uh, not every night. It comes by like every hour and uh, blows its horn, yet you're gonna hear it. I'm like, uh, definitely. It was another one where like the train horn was so loud at this hotel. I swear it was coming through my room. Um, so be careful about uh, those if you're light sleepers. Painkiller93 says this is a train geek's heaven. It would be. It would, you could just like enjoy, like have the train noise lull yourself to sleep if you're that much of a train geek. All right. Uh, Kristen says, oh no, taking a trip to Zurich in May and my hotel room is right next to the train station. Kristen, I would, I would go and like, uh, <laughs> go on that hotel's TripAdvisor site and like search the reviews for train, um, and see if you hear a lot of people being like, I couldn't sleep because of the darn train. Okay. Let's go on to number 12. Uh, number 12 this epic fail was when we were traveling on our last trip to Japan. We were here staying in Ito, Japan. And this hotel, we made the mistake, such a weird mistake. We, so I booked a room. Chris, what's the mistake? I haven't told you yet. I'll tell you the story that leads up to the mistake. We booked a room that had three beds in it, like specific myself, OC girl, the Curious Princess, we're like, it'll be fun. We will each have our own little bed right there. And you can see three beds in the room. So I booked a room with three beds. But I guess just as default, like for who's gonna be in the room, I put, you know, two people, whatever, two adults. I'm like, why does it matter? How many people in the room? There's three beds. Except you notice one of those beds is different than the other one. One of those beds, it just doesn't belong. What's different about that? The third bed they didn't make. In fact, they didn't not just not make it, they put a brown thing over it. And so I went down to the front desk and I I took a picture of it like that. <laughs> I brought, I was like, hey, uh, can I, why is this bed like this? And they're like, oh, well, cause you, there's only two people in your room. And I'm like, oh, there's three of us. There's my, my daughter in the room. Like, I'm like, can you make that bed for her? Or can I get bedding for it? They're like, yes, for about an extra 5,000 yen a night or about uh, $50 a night, maybe $40, something like that. I'm like, $40 just to bring like a bed sheet or something like that in it. Ultimately, I paid it because I thought it'd be lame if one of us had to sleep without a blanket. But it's like, that is a weird thing to think about that the room literally has three beds, but they make sure you pay extra to actually use the third bed, that only two beds come with a default room price, and if you wanna sleep on the third bed, you have to pay more. Yeah, those are the kind of things that you have to pay attention to when you're traveling in Japan. So people often ask me things like, Chris, I'm going to this hotel, and the hotel says they only, like they have a limit of like two people per room, how strict are they about it? Turns out they're actually pretty, pretty strict. 
okay. Number 13 right here uh, was on the same trip. We also went to the Fuji Five Lakes area right there. You see a picture of Mount Fuji. And we booked our trip to Japan about three months out, which apparently was not early enough to book hotels in the Fuji Five Lakes area during cherry blossom season. We had almost no hotels to choose from. I, I'm not kidding. Like nearly every hotel we would look at in this Fuji Five Lakes area was sold out. Not just like one room left for a thousand dollars, but like no rooms, no rooms, no rooms, no rooms. Finally, uh, we found the the Marriott that's not like in the center of the Fuji Five Lakes area, but it's maybe like 20 kilometers out from the main lake, but we're like, there's a room, hooray. And I think somebody must have booked it and canceled it. Cause then I, like I snagged that room and then it was gone too. That was the last room there. The moral of this story is if you are traveling to Japan for cherry blossom season, six months out, not three months out is probably where I would start with booking hotel rooms. But Japan is absolutely one of those like, I'll call it like a strange market where like Tokyo too as a city could just like totally book out. It is absolutely crazy. And then you're just like, you are out, uh, out of place to stay. And uh, that, and they make their money on their bed fees. Brandon says that bonus fee is crazy. I agree, it is crazy. Uh, and Todd says, come on, Japan. And uh, Muhammad from Singapore says, why do hotels in Japan have usually small rooms? They just don't have much space. And I think Japanese people, they don't travel with a lot of stuff. So they don't need huge room. They're not going to be in it all that long. Although the room you saw before was actually pretty big. Like some of the onsen hotels that we like to stay at, the traditional Japanese styles in, inns can actually have pretty big rooms. We tend to like big rooms. Uh, Adriana says, I like reading the reviews before traveling. I don't travel uh, as much as you before booking. Yes, that's a good plan too. So maybe you did as well. Kel says, I always make a backup reservation. That's interesting. Kel, tell me more about your backup reservations. Like back, you make a one for the hotel and another one. And then sometime later you decide to cancel one or, or what? Uh, and paint killer says BS fees suck. They sure do. All right. Number 14 right here, uh, is an experience I had uh, in Hawaii in 2018. I have uh, luckily not ridden in many ambulances in my life, uh, but this is one time that I did. So this is, this is me. I was on a trip to Oahu, which was gonna be a two week trip. And my first day, first full day. So we got to Oahu, spent the night at the hotel, uh, the, Mar the Marriott, the Marriott Waikiki took this picture off the balcony and the second day had a good second day. And then for dinner went to the Ala Moana food court. Well, I didn't actually get to the Ala Moana food court, you see, because I parked, uh, in the parking garage of the Ala Moana center. It is the, sh the largest shopping center in Hawaii. And I got on the escalator. <clears throat> and that's where the beginning of the end of my trip began. See, I was wearing these sandals that you see right here. And what happened as I stepped on the escalator was um, like the escalator step is let's pre let's pretend let's pretend here I'm gonna I'm gonna make the pictures away so you can see this so let's pretend uh, should I have a visual aid let's pretend that let's pretend this is the escalator step and this is my shoe and my sandal my sandal kind of clipped the edge of it and the bottom of my sandal went like this and then my feet went like this and if you know anything about escalators they have these like sharp teeth that are basically at the end of the step where they kind of fold up together and i'm convinced somebody must have been sharpening <laughs> that escalator because it was so sharp it ripped open my sock and ripped open the bottom of my toe in the process ah my white sock was now red. And as I hop to the top of the escalator and I sit on this planner and I hold my foot, I there's a guy at a jewelry store, like a security guard there. And he's looking at me and I'm looking at him and I'm clearing pain. I just say to the guy, I'm like, can you, can you call an ambulance, please? I think, I think I'm gonna need an ambulance. Uh, and I don't know if he called the ambulance, but he called the mall, the mall. Like all Moana is such a big mall. They have a, like a, I'd say like a paramedic team or somebody. So like a like a nurse on staff to Ala Moana shopping mall 
came over and looked at my toe and was like, okay, I'll, you know, let me call the ambulance. And he kind of like cleaned it up and applied something on it to stop the bleeding. Ambulance came and the way the shopping mall set up, as I told you, I had to take this escalator to get up there. The ambulance is at the bottom of the escalator. And so they're like, uh, can you make it down the escalator? And I'm like, like, if you all help me as crutches, I can make my way down. So I hopped on one foot um, onto the escalator and into the ambulance where I went to Kaiser Permanente on Oahu. Uh, they looked at my toe and, uh, the good news was it was just skin deep, but it was all the skin off the bottom of the toe, like flap hanging there. <laughs> so they're like, well, we can't really put it back on. We can't put stitches on. We just got to cut it off. And all the skin of your bottom of your toe is going to have to heal back. How long did that take? months that took months uh for years afterwards still scar tissue on the bottom i would say now from 2018 to now finally my toes like i'd say the skin like is kind of back to normal down there off the bottom so it's one of those little factoids about me if you ever need to like identify chris's dead feet or something you could look and see that little scar tissue on my left big toe so yeah right and so then todd goes dang chris especially with a two-week trip right so what did i do after that um, well, I should say that when I was in the ambulance on my way, uh, well, not my ambulance on the way there, with the Ala Moana sort of people, I was like, can you please not tow my car? Because I know the mall ends soon. I don't know if I'll be back tonight. So please don't tow my car. And they're like, okay, we won't tow your car. Uh, I did make it out of the hospital some hours later, still that evening. Uh, and it was, that's, that's the end of the trip. That's the end of the trip. So I booked, uh, Changed the flights, went back home the next day. Upgraded to first class because I needed the extra room. One of the things they did do at the hospital was like shoot it full of uh, shoot it full of Novocaine or something like that. Um, and so my toe was like super numb for the next day, which like let me like get through the airport to to get back home. Uh, but this is why like, I used to love. I should bring the picture back up here. The sandals. I used to love traveling in my reef sandals like this. No more, no sandals in airports ever again, because uh, they have a lot of escalators too. Um, so any place I'm going with escalators, no sandals, closed toed shoes, I leave the sandals when I'm at the beach or places like that, and I don't have any escalators to contend with. Uh, Josephus says, I hope your travel insurance covered it. Uh, Kaiser, my uh, HMO, health management organization that I'm a part of in Southern California, was also there in Hawaii, and so I didn't need travel insurance. Kaiser just covered it. it was, they took me to a Kaiser hospital. They did it. They paid for the ambulance. Um, so I was not out of pocket anything for the injury or the ambulance. Uh, I was out of pocket for the return flight back home. Okay. Numbers. Numbers. This is number 15. All right. Uh, epic travel failure number 15. This is one where like OC girl and I just felt stupid after this one. So we went to Bangkok, Thailand, which was a whole lot of fun. One of the things I was preparing on our way to Bangkok, not on our way, before I went to Bangkok, Thailand, was to do a video about scams in Bangkok. Because if you know anything about Bangkok, there's a lot of scams that go on in Bangkok. We talked about London scams earlier. So Bangkok scams. Number one at the top of my list is the taxi scam. What's the taxi scam in Bangkok? Well, it's basically where they don't they don't have a meter. They tell you there's no meter. There's no price to the meter. They charge you more than the meter, something like that. Some scam with a meter where they try to charge you more in the taxi. Super prevalent in Bangkok. And uh, so we're wise to this. And so when we get to Bangkok, we go to the official taxi rank where they have a official taxis where there's a taxi person to be like, you go in that taxi and they've like gotten a ticket and they give you information about the taxi and all these things. And we're in the taxi about 10 minutes, super most friendly taxi driver ever. And then Osigo and I in the back, we're sort of like, hey, where's the meter? Where's the meter in this taxi? There has to be a meter in this taxi. Otherwise they couldn't pick up at the airport. Where's the meter? Can't see a meter from where we're sitting. On the dashboard, we can see a hat and some red light underneath the hat, like peeking out from underneath the hat. Anyway, we're already in the taxi, so not much we can do at this point. Uh, but we're like, didn't Chris, didn't you write that script about this? I'm like, I know, I know. Why didn't we look to see if there was a meter before we got in? How are we halfway through the taxi ride before we noticed the meter's covered up by the hat? or there's no meter, whatever. 
Anyway, we get to the JW Marriott, Bangkok, and uh, the taxi driver quotes us a price about the ride that is like two to three times the price that it should be. To which point I say, well, what does the meter say? And he's like, well, there's no meter. And then I'm like, I think there is. I think it's under your hat. And he's like, it's not under my hat. I'm like, I can see the red lights under your hat. It's under your hat. What's the meter say? <laughs> you know, like 200 baht instead of 600 baht that he's quoting us or something like that. I probably would have given him a double tip because 200 baht isn't all that much. Uh, but we just felt really stupid. And then he should have too because he didn't get a tip and he only got what the meter said at that point. Uh, I find it unfortunate when people prey on uh, tourists like that. Okay. Number, ooh, going the wrong way on the numbers, number 16. This is when we took a trip to Fukushima Prefecture in Japan. Uh, and in Fukushima Prefecture in Japan, uh, we were in this town called Uichijuku, and we were uh, invited to Fukushima Prefecture by the Fukushima Tourism Department. <clears throat> and so for the five days we were in Fukushima, we were uh, shown around by a, like a production assistant and a translator and a tour guide to make sure we were able to get lots of great videos. They didn't pay us or anything to go there. Uh, but they like give us access to places. Uh, but as part of that, they wanted to make sure we like got footage of these places they gave us access to, like a sake factory and these sorts of things. Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because uh, I've had something happen there that never happened before. They took us to this town called Uichijuku that has a snow festival. It was so cold. It was like negative eight degrees Celsius or something that uh, literally my memory card failed on my camera. Memory too cold and all the files gone. Luckily, I generally back up my memory card every day when I go back to the hotel. Uh, however, comma, I had not backed up the video from that morning, which we went to a sake factory and then we went to this place and I didn't have another memory card on me, which meant that we had to scrap the entire second day after this of what we were doing and just do this day again um, so that we could like get this footage again. It was super hilarious going back to this same restaurant in this town that was owned by the same 80 year old Japanese lady that served us the day before. And we had a, like a rolling great conversation about the American guy in eight degrees Celsius who's wearing a t-shirt eating her soup cause aren't I cold? And I'm like, well, but it's, it's for the kid. I wasn't outside, we were in the restaurant legitimately. It wasn't that cold, it's hot soup. But then she's like, what are you doing back here? And I'm like, well, sorry. It'll be better the second time, right? This video is going to be so much better the second time. Mm. So my lesson learned on this one now is like when I'm on important trips or when I do things that I like, I can't, um, like I can't go back to, I will back up those files, not just when I go back to the hotel, but I'll do them in between. So I'll have my MacBook in a backpack or something like that. And I'm like, okay, which we're done with that shoot or we're done with that location, back up the files from that uh, to make sure we have a second copy. All right. Um, number 17, well, that was another one about snow. Um, we heard earlier uh, about uh, being stuck in the snow for eight hours from a tow truck. This wasn't quite that, but it absolutely could have been that. We took a trip in 2013 to Lake Tahoe and um, they, oh boy, they got so much snow in Lake Tahoe, like feet and feet and feet of snow over just a couple of days. And we drove a car up there and didn't have any snow chains, didn't have any ice brooms, didn't have any ice scrapers. I'm from San Diego. I don't know what none of that stuff is. What's that stuff? So I got to learn it real quick. Um, the good news when we were in Lake Tahoe is we were staying at uh, like one of the nicest hotels in Lake Tahoe. By the way, where's Lake Tahoe? Lake Tahoe is on the border between California and Nevada, um, kind of like east of Sacramento, big ski area in California. And the Hyatt is one of the nicest hotels there. And I guess they know that they're city slickers like us that drive up there without any chains. And so the good news was they sold chains and the staff at the hotel would actually put them on our car because California, we don't really do like winter tires or those sorts of things. And so if you've got a rental car that's got regular tires on it, it's got two wheel drive, you go nowhere fast in the snow and those things if you don't have chains on your 
uh, tires. So we had the hotel put chains on, then we went to the hardware store, we got ourselves an ice broom to clear the um, windshield, we got an ice scraper, uh, but it was good that we were able to do that at the Hyatt, because then we went to a couple other hotels after that, and we were definitely, we were in deep in the snow, and there would have been nobody to help us with chains or get our cars out of there. And um, then of course, like, how do you get the chains off when you get to the bottom of the mountain? <clears throat> there are actually people on the side of the road for $20 will cut your chains off and uh, and be done with them. So that's what we did too, because we had no tools to actually take the chains off ourselves. Uh, Cottage Full of Love says Tahoe just got pounded with snow over the last couple of days, like 10 feet. Yeah, it was like it was like eight feet or something like that when we were there. It was something absolutely crazy. And uh, Caltrans, the Department of Transportation California, when they clear the Interstate 80, which is the main highway from Lake Tahoe, going into Sacramento. They have these machines that are like snow eaters. They kind of look like the sandworm from Dune that like go down the highway and eat the snow in on the front and then have something that like blows it up and over and down into the canyon down here. It's like, it's a neat thing to see. And it really feels like something that you're on like some extra snowy planet. The tip here is if you're going into a snowy place, Make sure you have all the gear that you need and don't leave it up to buying it there. We got lucky that we were able to do that, um, but we could have also been stuck for uh, <laughs> eight or eight or ten hours, too. Okay, uh, this is my last one. This is number 18, and then we'll open up to Q&A and general hilarity and even more of your stories if you've got them, too, uh, which is number 18. When we were in Japan on our last trip, I talked about this hotel that had the three beds uh, that we only got to stay at two of them. And on that day when we were supposed to check into that hotel, which is this hotel, the hotel we actually went to was this hotel. Chris, how did you go to the wrong hotel? Well, this hotel, <laughs> the one that we actually stayed at, is called the Hoshino Resorts Kai Ito. Hoshino Resorts is the name of the company. It's kind of like Marriott in Japan. It's a big chain of Japanese hotels. Ito is the, uh, like, city, and then Kai is the type of hotel that it is. So, like, uh, a Marriott or a Courtyard or something like that. This is the Hoshino Resorts Kai Ito, the town. Well, in Google Maps, as we were going from Atami, the town to the north, to Ito, I just, Google Maps, I typed in Hoshino Resorts, Ito, so I typed in. And on my map, it only pulled up one, and so I'm like, well, that must be it. And so I hit navigate to get there, and we got to this one. Well, this is a second Hoshino Resorts Kai that is in the town of Ito, but it's called the Hoshino Resorts Kai Anjin. I didn't know that, didn't really realize that. Didn't realize there were two in the same town, just like a five minute drive from each other. But we got to this one, and amazing staff that like greets us at our car, has umbrellas, brings all of our luggage into the lobby. I present my information to the front desk staff and they look so confused. And they're like, hi, is this your name? Is this what the reservation is under? And I'm adamant that I have a reservation to be there. I sure do. And so I bring out the paper that has the reservation and they start to look at it. They don't say anything yet. Cause you know, like, I mean, in the USA, they would immediately look at it and be like, dummy. You're at the wrong place, but what do they do? They actually, then they get on the phone and they call up the other hotel just to make sure I have a reservation there. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. So you actually have a reservation at the Hoshino Resorts Kai Ito, which is just a five minute drive that way. Oh, I've called to confirm. You definitely have a reservation there. It's not at this one. We're so sorry, but they are expecting you at the other hotel, uh, which um, <laughs> I was just like, I've never done that before. I have never arrived at the wrong hotel before, but you know what? Uh, lesson learned that I should have really like, what I didn't do, Chris, what's your lesson to learn on this? What I didn't do before this trip and what I do on a lot of trips, but I didn't do on this one, uh, is for a lot of trips I like, will print out the locations of hotels on maps before I go. So I like generally roughly know where it is. And if I had any spatial awareness as to where this hotel was at all, I would have known it was not this one because this one was one block from the beach and this one's about 10 blocks from the beach. And so I like, I would have looked at the map when Google Maps would route me there and I'd be like, well, it can't be that because it's just not in the right place. Instead, I just 
remember the names of these places and put them in. I printed out the confirmations, but I didn't print out the associated maps to know where they were. Uh, Todd Ryan Casper says, what are the odds? Pretty low, I think, pretty low, but we, uh, we rolled the dice and lost on that one. Um, Jennified says, my girlfriend who works at the Lassen Resort up near Shasta called me while she was sitting in standstill's traffic because it snowed too much. The area's electricity was out cold. <laughs> cold, cold, cold. Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. All right, fellow explorers, if you've got an epic travel fail that you didn't share yet, well, I want to hear what it is. And if you're on the live stream, let me know what your questions are. Uh, if you think there's anything I uh, I left out of any of these stories, anything you want to know more about, uh, or you just want to know how the how the matcha tea mm, actually tastes. Todd Ryan Casper says, check the address. It's hard in Japan. Like, addresses in Japan really hard because they don't really have like streets and those sorts of things they just have like numbers of buildings it's like building number 528 in this neighborhood and so you can't like really look at the address the same way you do in other places but that's a good tip if you're in places that have like normal street addresses and normal streets zach says i experienced five days without hot water at the flamingo last Las Vegas, last January, no shower. Horrendous. That does sound horrendous, Zach. Did they at least give you like some money back or a discount or something like that? I hope so. Uh, that's a great story about the Flamingo to share. Not a great experience that you had. Uh, Kaj Full Love says, it's always that one time you're not extra prepared. It always is that one time. That's how it works. Jose says, hey, Chris, do you have any fails on bringing food through the TSA line? I generally don't, I generally don't bring food through the TSA line, so I don't think I have any fails on that. I think the closest one is that uh, my mom, she likes to carry perfume. And so uh, there have been a couple times where like her bottle of perfume isn't like labeled as to how many ounces there are. So, you know, some TSA people can be like, ah, that bottle, there's no label on it. So yes, labels of how many ounces of liquid are in things are absolutely super important. And I certainly haven't had the, the banana experience, but like fruit, uh, is one where like I don't travel with fruit or bananas or things like that because that can fruit can be ones that can get people into a lot of hot water. Brandon says, "What's the rating out of ten for the Starbucks matcha tea?" I mean, I'm a tea snob, so I'd probably give it a I'd probably give it a six and a half. There we go. Uh, College full of love says. Went whale watching in Monterey during the wrong season, and it was, as you call it, ocean watching. So boring, seasick for nothing. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Codge Full of Love. Whenever I talk about whale watching, Codge Full of Love knows when people say, Chris, should I go whale watching? And I, I actually call it ocean staring, as I call it, right? What are you doing on the boat? You're staring out into the ocean, and most of the time you don't see anything. And most of the whale watching tour companies, they will offer you another free tour if you don't see anything. And you're like, no thanks. I don't think I want to go on another tour of ocean staring. Eric says, uh, long time watcher, first time poster. Just wanted to say your videos are 10 out of 10. Eric, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. Leslie says, another great live stream. My travel fail was forgetting to convert enough funds and my bank card was not working at ATMs. Eek. Uh, Leslie, I'm curious, what, what country in the world are you from? And I say that because I hear this a lot. Um, Maybe I hear from people from Australia or things like that that talk about converting currency on their cards. Like U.S. bank cards, at least all the ones I have, I never convert a currency on them. I just, I take, my account has U.S. dollars in it. I have specific debit cards that I just use when I travel, but they only have U.S. currency on it. And then I take them and I charge things and the currency changes from whatever that international currency is to the U.S. dollars that drains out of the account. How did, how did that work for you, Leslie? I'm like, I'm genuinely curious because I hear your mistake a number of times uh, and I, I want to understand. Durham Skywalker says, I mistakenly took a local train instead of express train to the airport and missed my flight home. Oh no, that's awful. Yes, the difference between the local and the express can be a great difference, right? You're like the local train stops everywhere and waits for the other trains to go by and you're just watching your watch as you're like, my flight is gone, isn't it? Yip Animation said, my biggest travel fail was I went to New York for a week in 2015. My parents' house was perfectly fine when we left. When we got back, there was water. 
dripping all over to the point we had to move out of the house for eight months. Oh my gosh. Now we always shut off the water before going on vacation. Yip Animation, do you think this is because the pipes froze or what do you think caused that water leak? Jennified says our hot water heater went uh, out tonight. My hubby bought a new one today, installing it tomorrow. Cold showers, no fun. Hope you have hot water soon, Jennified. Eli and Eric says, would you take back these moments or do you consider them part of the traveling experience? Eli and Eric, I think they are absolutely part of the traveling experience. Uh, you know, I would take back the memory card failure because that, that one was pretty lousy. I would take back getting Topher stolen and I would take back uh, losing my toe skin at the Ala Moana. But all the other ones about like ordering too many pots, I'd also take back getting my luggage lost because um, that was lousy. Uh, to not have that for a week. All the other things, uh, th those are just travel. And they, they lead to the stories that you tell afterwards. Janelle says, if I drank matcha right now, I'd be up tomorrow at 7 a.m. You might, but I've been up since 5 a.m. this morning, and so, hmm, I needed some energy to get me through this live stream today. Roman says, have you ever been to Bora Bora, French Polynesia? Any plans to go and do a vlog? I would love to. I don't have any immediate plans, but Roman, if you know anybody in Bora Bora, French Polynesia, that would like to invite us, we would love to go. Uh, Paint Killer says, another bad experience was after a long cruise, my family flew back across the country. By the time we got home, it was night and we were tired. Our neighbors had a loud party the same day. Yes, and then you can't sleep, and it's awful. Sorry to hear that. Darkson34 says, what's the furthest you've flown in economy? Los Angeles to Singapore. What is that, like 16, 17, 18 hours? Depends which way you're going. I've done that in economy a number of times. Uh, as a mileage run, in fact, sometimes, where I've like gone and just been in Singapore for less than a day and come back because I needed to get my United 1K status. That was a young Chris, old Chris, that has responsibilities and a daughter doesn't uh, do that anymore, but would still sit in economy because Chris doesn't have the kind of money to roll in business class on the way to Singapore. Neil says, good morning from Germany, my first time live. Neil, welcome, thank you. Nair Road says, my wife had to take a cold shower at the GW Mayor in Orlando due to construction in the building that affected the water. We were not told about it, got some money back. Glad you got some money back, paint killer. Um, paint killer. Good, you got your money back, narrow road. Paint killer. Another travel fail was not knowing how far Gatwick's from London, and I took a local train there, missed my flight, and had to spend the night at the airport. Yes, there are two airports. There's actually five airports in London. The major ones are London Heathrow and London Gatwick. Heathrow's actually really close. Like, the train from Pennington Station is like 18 minutes or something like that. Gatwick is way, way, way far away. So that is uh, important to be aware of. And Yip says... Uh, the eight month move out for the water leak, a toilet pipe burst on the second floor, dripping to the first floor. Ooch, sorry to hear that. Um, Leslie says, travel from Canada to Vegas, had to use my credit card for everything. Luckily found a $5 bill in my luggage tip. The bellman won't make that mistake again. Uh, all right. Grant says, for some reason, my saved shows on Hulu were offline on my flight from London Heathrow. Uh, in-flight entertainment was also busted. Long, boring, nine and a half hour flight. Yeah, I didn't put this one on here, but I've certainly had that experience too. My pro tip on this is like, I use this Disney Plus to watch a lot of things. Like the night before, or actually the morning of, like maybe even both, you know, the night before, I'll go and check to make sure the videos are still cached and online, but they could time out the next day. Um, and so like even the morning of, just like a quick scan to be like, does all my move to all my movies or TV shows work? Otherwise I'm gonna be really, really bored. Um, uh, Tavin says, I've arrived at the wrong hotel in Japan as well. There are a million different APA hotels. There are, big chain. Uh, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Uh, and Jenny Fied says, poor Tover. Hopefully he's making someone happy in London. I hope he at least went to a great home. Josephus says, we waited in line with other people outside uh, Zieg House Keller in Zurich, only to find that we should have got in 30 minutes ago if we said we had a, like a reservation. Good thing the waiter still held our table. Absolutely, that's a good tip. If you're in a line and you have a reservation, sometimes you might try to make it to the front to be like, I have a reservation. Thank you. Katie94 says, my travel fail is miscalculating the time zone change and travel time zone from LX to the Maldives and accidentally booking the flight home a day early. Oh no, and shortening your vacation. That's an easy one to do, not paying attention to the time changes or not paying enough attention to them. Adriana uh, says, I live in the USA from Mexico and I travel to Mexico cash from ATM. 
They don't give you the option. It's always Mexican currency. Banco Santander, my favorite. Nuke Bomb says, have you ever been to New Zealand? Not yet. Uh, Laurel says, I found that I can lock and unlock my debit card traveling soon. Yeah, many banks have that feature where you can lock your debit card so people can't use it. So you can like go on the go online, unlock it, take your money out, lock it again. That way people steal it. They can't use it. Uh, Eddie says, would you ever go to Northern California, Redwoods, Eureka? Absolutely. It's on our list to spend more time and make more videos up there. Uh, it just tends to tends to not, not be a place we end up all that much. Um, Jay says, we had to take our cab driver for a walk around several blocks around the city because he didn't have Scottish currency. Finally, a credit union card worked after our, all of our other cards failed. Jay, that's... Yeah, that's a, I, heard, I hear this one a lot of the, like, getting in a taxi cab without any local currency and then your credit card doesn't work. Um, I'm sure you already know this, Jay, but, like, my pro tip on this one is, like, always take out some local currency at the airport so that if you have this experience, then you can actually pay. Uh, the Nuke Bomb says, where should I stay? In Lake Tahoe Incline Village or South Lake Tahoe. We stayed at the... Hyatt in Incline Village. I like the Hyatt there. If you want to, it depends whether you kind of like a more town setting or you like a more rural setting. Incline Village is more rural. If you want the more town thing that also has like casinos and stuff like that, it's a little more bustling than South Lake Tahoe. Uh, and Zach says, when will you be coming to Southeast Asia again? I don't know. Um, our next trip planned is to Banff in Canada. The Nuke Bomb says, uh, and my Airbnb is right above Tonkatsu Ginza Byron. Can't wait. One of my favorite restaurants in Hawaii, uh, in Waikiki. Really super delicious. Yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. All right, fellow explorers, it is time for a giveaway. And in every one of my videos, I always give away a yellow Productions Crew shirt to someone who can answer one of my questions correctly. And to answer my question correctly, it is Brandon Torres's birthday. And so I want to wish Brandon a happy birthday. The answer to this question or the question is, how old is Brandon Torres today? And if you can answer that question, you will win this Yellow Productions Crew shirt. Uh, if you don't get to win one, you can buy one. You can pick one up at the Yellow Productions shop. You'll find the link right there in the screen or in the description below. And if you wonder, Chris, when is the next live stream? You can head over to the Yellow Productions update. You can sign up for my email list where I'll email you every time I schedule a live stream, let you know the topic and the date so you can join in with all the fun when these shows are live. All right, and I see uh, in the chat, some right answers. And now we have a winner, winner chicken dinner. Okay, I see a number of right answers, but we will click this button to see the first one. Lots of numbers that came in. Congratulations to <coughs> Janelle Travels. You are the first one to say the correct answer, which is Brandon Torres is 24 years young today. By the way, for the people who knew the right answer, they were here at the beginning when we were chatting in the chat and they saw me ask Brandon how old he is. So that was how early you had to get here today and read the chat to get that right answer. So well done to all of those of you that answered 24. Janelle, send me an email, chris at yellow-productions.com. Links in the description, t-shirt size, address, I'll get that headed right over to y'all. Fellow Explorers, if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up on your way out and send a big happy birthday to Brandon. All right, see you next time.